Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire supported by Glenn David Books. I'm going to focus today on an exceptional civil servant who recently passed away. Unlike his colleagues who want jobs in political and economic ministries, he chose deliberately to work in public health and education. And the impact that he's made will be remembered for years. But he was much more than just a civil servant. He wrote a highly acclaimed biography of M.S. Subalakshmi. He had a passion for Uttarakhand, its mountains and people. And in Almora, where he spent the early years of his career, he's considered a hero. But he was also a most engaging personality. His friends say he had a penchant for attractive socks. He was extremely fond of marzipan and he enjoyed a single malt after dinner. I'm referring to India's former health secretary, Kesav Desi Raju, who died on the 5th of September. Joining me now to talk about him is his friend, the well-known author and historian, Ram Chandra Guha. Ram Guha, let's start with your description of cases of Desi Raju in an essay that you recently wrote for The Telegraph. You say, he was the most exemplary Indian of my acquaintance, exemplary as a public servant, scholar, teacher, family man, and friend. That's high praise indeed. What was it that made him so special? I think current is that he was so exemplary in all dimensions. As you said in your introduction, his work as a civil servant and policymaker impacted hundreds and thousands of Indians and will have long lasting effects. Uh, arguably, no civil servant in recent memory has got this kind of spontaneous appreciation and tributes after he died. Uh, but he was also a scholar who wrote a considerably uh, deeply researched and widely acclaimed biography of M.S. Subalakshmi. He was a family man devoted to his sisters, his nephews and his nieces, a wonderful caring friend, uh, a lover of uh, good things, uh, a discerning uh, reader of literature um, and um, much else. And, you know, when I say that, I, I said I, I made that judgment current after some thought. You know, I'm, I'm not young. I'm in my 60s like you and indeed Kesha was. I've lived in different parts of India. I've uh, interacted with people in different walks of life. I've known many great Indians, many great scholars, many exemplary civil servants, uh, outstanding writers, activists. But I think it's what he did in every sphere of life. Current, you know, people who are high achievers, this term high achiever, uh, you and I know people who are wonderful artists, but incredibly self-absorbed. Very successful CEOs, but maniacally ambitious and not really concerned about the feelings of other people. And of course, in politics, these kind of sentiments to, to be successful, you have to be brutal and ruthless and often uncaring. So Keshav was a hugely successful and impactful public servant. And yet he had these other dimensions to his life, which really made him a wonderfully rounded character. And which is why I called him uh, based on three decades of my friendship and close acquaintanceship with him, the most exemplary Indian of my acquaintance. It, if you look, consider all these dimensions, I, I have known greater scholars than him. I have known civil servants who may have had as much of an impact as him. I, I have friends who were, I had, were as wonderfully witty as he was. But if you look at everything, he was just something special. I want to, to everyone who, everyone, everyone who knew him and befriended him would say that. I want to touch on many of the points you make, but let's start with his term as health secretary, because for many people, that's how he was first known to them. As I said in that introduction, most civil servants seek careers in political and economic ministries, maybe the defense ministry, that is the path to progress, to success, and maybe to achievement when you retire. But he deliberately chose to work in public health and education. Doesn't that, in a sense, make him unique? It does. And I add a third area in which he had a deep interest and in which he also worked uh, he had an important tenure in, in the environment ministry. He was deeply interested in questions of sustainable development, uh, afforestation, water conservation and so on. So education, health and environment really would determine our future, you know, our long term future, the education of our children, the health of our population, the survival of our species on, on the planet. And of course, health is the sector in which he worked longest in a most focused way because he was posted as additional secretary health and then as secretary health and in Uttarakhand also he handled the health portfolio. But I know that for him it was education, health, education and environment all together. Uh, among, the, among the letters I've been getting from friends was one from the very well-known educationist Vimla Ramachandran who wrote to me about the very important role Keshav played 
in, this, in the early years of the Mahil, uh, of the edu- uh, you know the the the, uh, the, the, the primary uh, you know, sort of uh, education program. So he had this interest in areas which impacted people quietly uh, under the radar, but really made a profound difference to their lives. Now, of his term as health secretary. Samya Swaminathan, the present chief scientist of the World Health Organization and a former director general of the ICMR, says his two lasting and outstanding achievements were firstly developing a national mental health policy, and secondly, the creation of Entagi, which is today playing a critical role in COVID vaccination. And she points out that in both cases, he went out of his way to involve and bring in people from outside the government, NGOs in the first instance, and in fact, even critics of the government's immunization policy in the second. I can't think of too many civil servants who would have involved outsiders, including critics, in crafting a government policy. So, uh, Swaminathan is absolutely right. It is inclusive dialogic approach to policy making, which makes him so made him so different from other civil servants and politicians. But I had a third area uh, in health in which he made important contributions, apart from mental health and vaccination and immunization, and that is in disability rights. There was a beautiful tribute in the Indian Express by Joe Chopra, which talked about his work for people and particularly children with special uh, difficulties. And some of the laws that the government has passed, for example, reservation in jobs for people with disabilities, access uh, to public spaces for people with disabilities. He played an instrumental role in all of that too. So, and, and I also add that apart from consulting with NGOs, the government critics, he had a profound respect for science and scientists. You know, which is of course unusual in his in in in, in the Carter because civil service always rank people. They look at a, a vice chancellor walks into their office and they say, "This man's salary grade is that of a deputy secretary three grades before me. Let him wait outside for one hour." But Keshav being perhaps from a family of scholars, had profound respect for scientists and experts and consulted them, which was unusual in uh, his tribe. And of course, is something sorely missing in our government today, which has a great deal of disdain for scientific expertise. So with people like Samya Swaminathan and others, for example, with the professors in Nimhans, uh, our premier institute of mental health, which he, which he was instrumental in making an institution of national importance. The, the psychiatrists at Nimans uh, really admired him because he knew that they had something to give which he didn't have and he would listen to them and translate it into policy. He was also a man very true to his principles, to scruples and morality. I believe that his stand against corruption in the Medical Council of India and his opposition to the influence of the tobacco lobby in the health ministry led to the UPA government transferring him out as health secretary. Would I be right in saying that this, in fact, ended up further burnishing his reputation, but it left an indelible black mark on the UPA? Absolutely, because he was one of their most outstanding officers. He was doing wonderful work. He was widely admired in the health, health, health community. And his minister, I should name him, Ghulam Nabi Azad, took the decision to sack him. Uh, the chairman of the UPA, Sonia Gandhi, did nothing. And Manmohan Singh typically did nothing either. And Manmohan Singh knew Sonia Gandhi was a little outside the administration, so she may have gone with what her minister recommended. But Manmohan Singh knew precisely what a remarkable officer Keshav Desi Raju was. So I think that is indeed a black mark on the UPA government uh, to so teach with such cavalier, uh, you know, how do I put it, um, brutality, one of the most outstanding officers they had to the cost of the country. In fact, because of the tobacco lobby, because of the tobacco lobby and the crooks who controlled the Medical Council of India. But in fact, you're saying something else as well. At a moment when Dr. Manmohan Singh should have stood up for an extremely, if not exceptionally good officer, he failed to do so. Absolutely. Now, Keshav Desi Raju, as I said in that introduction, was a lot more than just a civil servant. He wrote a highly acclaimed biography of M.S. Subhalakshmi, And this is how you describe that book in your essay. You say it's one of the two best books on an Indian musician. Tell me, why do you say that? So, Karan, again, if I may, uh, that judgment was based on careful thought and reasoning. I am, as you know, a biographer myself. So I know what it takes uh, to 
craft and research and write a good biography. The other book I had in mind, uh, with which I clubbed Keshav's of Gifted Voice, The Life and Art of M.S. Subalakshmi, was a brilliant biography of Ravi Shankar, the sitar player Ravi Shankar, by his English disciple Oliver Krask, which is called, um, you know, uh, which, which is, um, you know, an Indian son is what it's called. And again, it's a beautifully researched biography, attentive to the person, uh, their music and their influence. And Ravi Shankar and M.S. Subalakshmi Karan were the two, they made possibly greater musicians. You know, you could argue that Ali Akbar Khan as an instrumentalist or Bismillah Khan was as great as Ravi Shankar. If you look at Carnatic vocal music, M.L. Vasant Kumari is often spoken and D.K. Patamal and Aryakuda, Aryakudi Ramanuja Ayengar are often spoken in the same breath as M.S. But what was distinctive about M.S. and Ravi Shankar was that they had a pan-Indian and a global appeal. They took that classical art form which was special to one part of India, in MSS case, South India, to the rest of the country and then took it universally. And they had very interesting personal lives too. And Oliver Krask in his book on Ravi Shankar and Keshav Deshi Raju in his book on MS Subalakshmi uh, really pre presents a beautifully researched and well-rounded portrait of the person, their art and their times, which you, which you, which you, um, very rarely get, you know, you get hagiographic works by disciples, you get personal anecdotal accounts by people who knew Vilayat Khan or Ravi Shankar or Ali Akbar or, and there's a good books with music, by the way. I would, I, I mean, I, I read a lot of music because I'm a biographer and I have a great interest in classical music. Uh, for example, Sheila Dhar's Rag and Josh is a delightful collection of portraits of people. Kumar Mukherjee's book, The Lost World of Hindustani Music is un, again a wonderful anecdotal book. But in terms of deeply researched cultural biographies, Trask's book on Ravi Shankar and um, Keshav's book on MS Standout for their rigor, their detail, and their accessibility. In fact, in that essay sense. that you wrote in the Telegraph, you give a wonderful example of how well he knew and understood MS Subhadakshmi. You say, and I'm quoting you, on a long train ride back from Anupur to Delhi, he told me about every MS concert he had attended with near perfect detail of every composition he had heard us sing. He had a fantastic memory which he could recall and this shows the depth of his knowledge, his interest and understanding. Uh, immersion, again, what I didn't say in that article, Karan. So we were, he was chatting, what happened, what had happened was in Amar Kantak on that trip in Madhya Pradesh, we read about MS getting the Bharatatna. On the train back to Delhi, he was telling me about her music and uh, the, all the concerts he attended from the first one, which was in Bombay Shanmukhananda Hall when he was eight. And at some stage I intervened, I said, Keshav, you know, I follow Hindustani music. I don't follow um, uh, Carnatic music much, but I heard MS speak, uh, sing once. It was in Kamani in 1979. And I remember uh, she, had, she, was, uh, she followed Bismillah Khan. She followed Bismillah Khan. She followed Bismillah Khan. And, uh, uh, he said, but I don't remember what she sang. He said, I was in the IAS Academy and I came, uh, I took leave from the IAS Academy and came down for this concert. And she began with this, then she went to that, and then she went to that. So he was able to recount, you know, a, a concert I had attended 20 years later perfectly. Composition what? by composition. He also had a great fondness, if not a passion, for Uttarakhand, its mountains and its people. And in fact, the people of Almora, where he spent the early years of his career, virtually look upon him as a hero. This is what you write of Almora. You say, Keshav may have touched more lives in more salutary ways than any other civil servant of his generation. Yeah, I say that uh, for several reasons, uh, Karan. One is that, you know, you know people, for example, there have been some first rate uh, um, finance secretaries. If you look at the important uh, process of economic liberalization and its emancipation of people out of poverty since the 1990s, people like Montek Singh Alubalia, Vijay Kelkar uh, played an important role. Uh, but Kesha worked, but they only worked at the center. They only worked in Delhi. Kesha worked in Albora, uh, in Delhi, in Uttarkashi, uh, uh, in Dehradun, in the state secretariat, and then, of course, um, in, 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 sorry, 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 in, in, in the center. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's really, uh, that's, 
so in that sense, he um, had impacted he impacted people at three levels: at at the at the at the district, the state, and the center. And uh, of course, he had this profound impact through his health policies. And I say as a caveat, exempl exemplary civil servant of my that generation, which by which I mean there were people before, for example, Sukumar Sen, the first chief election commissioner, who uh, profoundly transformed um, uh, how Indians think of democracy, may have had a greater impact, but he was many decades before. I know that Keshav Desi Raju spoke four or five languages fluently. Did that include either Garhwali or Kamauni? No, it didn't, Keshav, but uh, it didn't, um, uh, Karan, but most, uh, most young children and adults in Garhwal and Kumau speak Hindi. Uh, and he spoke absolutely flawless Hindi. It's only the older women in remote areas, in remote hamlets, who would speak Garhwali and not, not Hindi. Uh, so he spoke Hindi fluently, but not Garhwali or Kumau. Let's come to Keshav Desi Raju, the man. You say, we both like to think of ourselves as Nehruvian Indians, and you add, Keshav Desi Raju detested Hindutva. Does that mean that he would never have been able to get on with this government? You know, uh, that's an interesting question that I've been thinking about. You know, he was an exemplary officer who did what he who followed the constitution, not his minister or the political party in power. That's why he fell foul of the UPA. Now, obviously, this government likes loyalists. It likes people loyal to Narendra Modi. It pre prefers people who have served in Gujarat, who generally get all the plump posts, uh, people who ask no questions. But, you know, an officer like this kind, of this kind, would not have been wasted by the Vajpayee government. You know, uh, he retired in 2015. Uh, the UPA had ceded power. If he had retired when Vajpayee was in power, Vajpayee would have made sure that such a remarkable officer got a post retirement job. He would have been wonderful in, for example, the Telecom Regulation Authority, because he is so fair and objective and scholarly. He would have been an outstanding member or chairperson of the UPSC, so, because he was so good at nurturing and directing young officers. So it's also, to the, just as it is to the discredit of the UPA, that they did not protect him from the corrupt cabal that ran uh, the MCI and the tobacco lobby. It is also the discredit of the Narendra Modi government, 60 is a young age that when this person retires, you don't give him a good post retirement job commensurate with his capabilities. So as a friend and as a lover of music, I'm grateful that they were vindictive because he used the time in retirement in Chennai to write his landmark biography of M.S. Subalakshmi. Now, he was also, it seems, a very engaging individual. Akshay Mangla, writing in the Hindustan Times, says that Desi Raju was fond of attractive socks. He had a liking for marzipan, and he enjoyed a good single malt after dinner. He was a man who liked the good things of life as well. Yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, and he enjoyed travel. He enjoyed travel across India. I mean, I took a wonderful trip with him to South Africa uh, when our mutual friend Gopal Gandhi was High Commissioner, and we traveled across South Africa. He went with other friends to Italy, to Europe, uh, to the Northeast. He loved the Northeast, different parts of the Northeast of India. Uh, he liked... Uh, a glass of single malt. He was a great connoisseur of South Indian vegetarian food and he cooked it expertly himself. <laughs> you know, so, of course, there were very, very sides to his life. He liked detective stories. Uh, he well, didn't just like classical music, he liked pop music. He wasn't a cultural snob, though his passion lay in one direction. He could appreciate popular art forms. He was an extraordinarily rounded and civilized human being. He was also an extremely modest person. Most people didn't realize that he was former President Radha Krishnan's grandson or the nephew of the internationally acclaimed historian S. Gopal. These were not things he boasted about. He didn't even slip them into the conversation as most people would tend to do. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that was, I mean, he wanted to be himself. He admired his grandfather. Uh, he had great respect for his uncle's scholarship. His uncle Gopal always ran the first drafts of his book past his nephew, not just his fellow scholars, but because he respected the judgment, the debut judgment. But he never paraded their name, used their name. Uh, he had a proper familiar relationship with them, which he never exploited for his own personal purposes. The sad thing is he died pretty young. He was only 66 at the time. But as you point out in that essay, by a happy coincidence, 
He died on the same day his grandfather was born, the 5th of September. Would that have had some special meaning for him? Well, I don't know. It's very poignant and unusual because his, he died on the Sunday morning. He spoke to me on Friday. You know, we spoke two or three times a week, which he did with many friends. He spoke to Gopal Gandhi, who was his closest friend, almost every day. So he spoke to me on Friday. He spoke to his dear friend Gopal Gandhi on Saturday evening. He spoke to his sisters, I think later that day or maybe the next morning, and he went. So he had made, and he show, I'm sure he'd spoken to his other close friends before. So, you know, I mean, the loss is there for everyone who knew him. But I would like to celebrate the extraordinary life he lived. Uh, he would have written other books. You know, he was going to write a book on the composer Tyagaraja, on whom very little is known, and you really have to dig and scratch to find out authentic historical material. He was learning Telugu for that purpose. But it was such a, you know, he went quietly without fuss. You know, his death was also in keeping with the manner of a man because he did not want to linger, give his sisters, his nieces, his dead, his friends trouble. Trouble, he just went quietly. And it so happened in a beautiful uh, uh, sort of unconscious symmetry, he died on 5th September, not just his grandfather's birthday, Teacher's Day. And he was, of course, such a wonderful example to all of us uh, to learn from. We're coming to the end of this interview. Kesha Desi Raju was a close and dear friend of yours for 25 or 30 years. Do you have an abiding memory that you will always carry with you? Well, I have many uh, current, but if you allow me to permit one, and it'll take me a few minutes to spell it out. Because it concerns uh, a mutual friend, the person I've already described as Keshav's closest friend, Gopal Gandhi. Uh, in 1997, when Gopal was uh, then, I just was finishing his term as the founder director of the Nehru Center in London, which he established as a wonderful sort of uh, place where Indian things were dis discussed. He was appointed a high commissioner to South Africa. So he came home and he decided uh, to be briefed by the MEA and he decided he wanted the blessings um, of the posthumous blessings of the sage Ramana Maharishi in his ashram in Tiruvannamale. So he told Keshav and me, you have to come with us, come with me. I met them at Madras bus station. We took a bus, you know, an additional secretary or a joint secretary to government and a, and a high commissioner and I, of course, I wasn't entitled to Sarkari Gadis, which was fine. The three of us went in a state transport bus to the ashram. We mostly talked about MS. Then we, you went to the ashram, then you take a parikrama of the ashram. You know, that's a ritual thing. And we were walking around and Gopal, before we left the ashram for the parikrama, said, give me a bottle of bottled water. So they gave it to him, the ashram trustees, and he was crushing it tightly to his chest. And this is a sign of how, how much, how close Kesha was to Gopal, but also how he could joke about his closest friend. And we began the walk and it began to get hotter and hotter and hotter. You think of Tamil Nadu, it you know, it's brutal, like, like Delhi today. And he said, Parva Ram, that doesn't matter. Let Saar, we used to call Gopal, call Gopal Saar, which is Saar affectionately. Let Saar have that bottle. He's a Londoner now, he's a London stomach. You and I are naturalized hillmen. We'll drink from a farmer's horse pipe along the way, which is exactly what we did. <laughs> so, you know, that's the kind of lovely light touch he had, even with his, uh, someone he admired as much as Gopal. He could tease him and, you know, uh, in, in this way about his lack of an Indian stomach, despite being India's high commissioner to South Africa. He seems like an exceptional person. I'm particularly grateful, Ram Guha, that you've spent time bringing to life, if I can put it like that, a man who should never be forgotten and always remembered. Thank you very much for this interview. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Can I, just one thing. I apologize about the phones. I have FaceTime on my computer. So my daughter called me twice. Please don't okay? worry. I apologize to your daughter for the fact that you were talking to me and not able to take her call. Please wish her the best. Okay, thanks. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Thanks.